This is a square turn tractor, about a 1917 model. It was made in North Fork, Nebraska. There are very few of these left in existence, and I only know of one or two other than this one. The steering wheel is strictly to, uh, when you're, you're plowing, to keep it at minor adjustments. But when you turn, you can pull one clutch lever back, and all it is is friction drive. There's a, one gear forward and one gear backwards, and it's strictly by an eccentric that pull these two leather cones back against the drive. Plate. There's a friction drive here and there's a friction drive back there. And these two are the drives that go to each one of the wheels. And your levers back there, you can engage this over on this side or over on that side, whichever direction you're going. And you can, this is, is on an eccentric. When you turn it, it um, engages in one or the other. And you can engage it here on this side engage this one over there, then you've got your square turn. This is a Minneapolis 2550, built from uh, roughly 1911 to 1914. It's a four-cylinder upright engine. Uh, the uh, engine is uh, jacketed meaning that the uh, sleeves come down over the engine. It's not part of the case itself. Uh, runs real nice. It's noisy as heck underneath that, uh, that cowl there. As best as I know, this is a 1917. It's an Altman Taylor 3060 tractor. And the way you see it back there now is, is original. It's never been restored. It was one of Carl, uh, Carl Memke's father, Walter Memke, who started the collection. It was one of his original tractors that he farmed with here on the property. And uh, the bits of paint you see are original paint. Early gas tractors used radiators that were much like boilers on the steam tractors. You can see it's got tubes in it, just like a boiler does. And this one has fans on it. Before we started it, we went and looked at lubrication, made sure that the lines were flowing with oil, got some gas in it, made sure it had a spark, and just kind of looked it over to see if there was anything broken or anything that we'd need to look at, look at after it got running. This rare one-cylinder Hart Par engine number 6215 can be stubborn and curmudgeonly, reminding us to always use care when starting these powerful old machines. My father bought a tractor, which is that one-cylinder hard car, 
And this is in the scrapyard. I would say it would be about 1960. Somebody brought it in complete. And it is our, one of our rare tractors, that one. And we worked on it. It was complete, but it was completely rusted up. And we ran it here today, and, and uh, it's quite unusual. and a 10 inch stroke and it turns 500 rpm we're supposed to we're running about 430 rpm we're down a little bit and as i understand they're very rare possibly maybe three of them in the world carl and his dad uh, started working on this i guess about 20 years ago but they had too many other projects so they just kind of dropped it so him and i picked it up here a couple weeks ago and and dug into it and got it working the big problem with it was is that governor uh it, carl had to make a new shaft and and re-pour the babbitt bearing in it and uh, i come up with the linkage and the and that end of it so between the two of us we got the thing put together that's a cast wheel, which you don't see a lot of them. There's other tractors use it, but uh, it's kind of unique. Well, I like them all. I like them all, but we have several one-cylinder tractors here, which is a hard par and a rumbling, and uh, I just uh, smile all over when they fired up. This 1911 model 1530 one-cylinder Rumley oil pull gets its name by using oil to cool the engine. It weighs 16,500 pounds and has a 10-inch bore and a 12-inch stroke. These rear wheels are 70 inches in diameter, just under six feet. Since we're all fired up, let's pin on a few plows and take the 75 and 110 out for a test drive. At the barn, we caught up with Carl and asked for a guided tour. 
In addition to 20 operating steam traction engines, there are over 60 gas or diesel powered machines, not to mention combines, trucks, and cars. This is a 15 horse case engine. This came from the Belt Mountains in uh, what we call the old Peterson engine. It's a 1545 case. And uh, we have had it running in the past, but we haven't had it uh, upgraded as far as the certificate or the inspection. And here's a 20, 20 horse case engine. It's a compound uh, steam engine. And uh, it hasn't been rebuilt yet, but uh, it's all there in case somebody wants to rebuild it. This one here is a gas engine. It's a, what they call a Rock Island Plow Company. It's a hider and it's a friction drive that, uh, this is the, the transmission part here, but this motor slides back and forth, and this is the friction that drives from the motor. The motor drives these gears here, these uh, big uh, plates here, and you shift it back and forth from one side to the other, is one is reverse and the other is forward. And when you slide the motor back and forth, you get your variation of speed on this big cylinder or disc right here. And here's a, t this is a 20 horse case. It's I believe one of our oldest, older engines. And we haven't used it for several years either. This is a, a heart part tractor, 1836. It's a three speed transmission on this. The motor's crossways. And uh, they used to be quite popular in our country. Uh, there was a dealership in um, Great Falls that advertised that they shipped these tractors in at one time, not a, a car load of them on the, on the railroad, but a train load. And I saw a picture of it once where they, this 1836 tractor was popular in this country. Of course, they had a real good deal dealership. That meant a lot. This is a 3060 hard par tractor, and it was very popular in its day. It had the reputation that uh, this tractor, they called it the old reliable, is the one that more or less put the steam engines out of uh, uh, business because it was run by one man, and uh, it was uh, oil cooled, very dependable, two cylinder, and they advertised in the in the manual that. Uh, if you had a light load, you could run it on one cylinder for a half a day, then switch it over and hang up the other cylinder, which is the valve, and then it would run the, it would just lighten the load and it would use less gas. But on a heavy load, well, then they would use both cylinders. Here's another hard part. It's uh, 1836, and this, uh, this is a two-speed two tractor. The other hard par that we just showed a little while ago at 1836 was a three-speed. This case here is what they call a 1020. It was built from 1915 to 1920. They had this arrow on the front because the driver couldn't see where the wheel was at, so they had an arrow to point which direction the wheel was turning. And it was a very popular tractor in its day, but it was only three wheeled and it had a tendency to tip over. Now this tractor here is a 2545 case, about 1930. It was 25 horsepower on the draw bar and 45 on the belt. Now this, this tractor here is a 2040 case. It was built from 1912 to 1920. It was very popular tractor, two-cylinder post. It had an eight-bore, eight-inch bore and a nine-inch stroke, and a two forward speeds, one reverse. This is a Rumley, a 20 horsepower. It was a very heav heavy engine. It came from Big Sandy, Montana. It's a two-cylinder, and we used to run the, most of these steam engines on our thrashing days in the 60s, 50s, and 60s, 70s. But we haven't had this one up to date for 20, 25 years. This 
This Altman Taylor is a 16 horsepower, and we got this at the McKamey Ranch. They were very popular in their day. This one uh, runs, but we haven't had it updated. This engine here is a 20 horse advanced engine, and it came from Bozeman, Montana, and uh, it was a, uh, an uncle of Jim Dawson, who was a very uh, uh, close friend of my dad's. Jim Dawson also uh, ran my dad's 110 case when he was in the thrashing business. This engine here is a simple advanced engine and we restored it in 1968 and it come from Missoula, Montana. This is an Avery tractor in 1911, it's a 30 horsepower and we call it an undermount because the undermount, the motor is underneath the boiler and the rest of the engines, the motors are on top of the boiler. That's what makes this engine so tall is because the motor is down below. And this engine came from Wolf Creek, Montana, and it was back in the mountains, and we had to truck a caterpillar up in the hills and pull it out and, of course, load it on the truck and bring it back down. As a collector's item now, it's a very sought-after engine because it's unusual. The motor is underneath and the boiler is up on top. This steam engine here is a 2575 Gar Scott. My father and I went up to get that in the middle of the winter and it was frozen in the ground I'd say about a foot deep uh, and we chiseled and we worked on that for three or four days getting it loose and when we finally got it loose well we hired a D7 to come up and pull it out and it was it's completely restored it's a very very powerful engine it's a two-cylinder and it's a heavy boiler. It's a butt strap boiler and it's a, what they call a rear mount which is uh, used for plowing as well as anything else. But this was originally used when we got it in the sawmill. Uh, this is a, a six-cylinder uh, crawler tractor made by the International Tractor Company and it's a 1935, they call it a T40 and they didn't make too many of them. Most of them were made of uh, four-cylinder diesel. This is a T20, and it was made in 1936, and it was right about the same time that they were changing colors. The original, the, four, the first uh, international McCormick Deering tractors were a kind of a battleship gray, and in the 30s at some time, they started painting their tractors red. This is a 1929 Caterpillar, a 10, they call it. That's the smallest caterpillar they made in the 20s sometime. It's one of the smallest caterpillars they made at that time. And this is a, a 15 caterpillar. That's the next size larger. Same vintage. They were after the 15, then they come with a 20 caterpillar. And this is made in the 20s, 1928 this one is run 1100 RPMs, 28 horsepower. Then the next size larger is this 30. This is a 1926, it's a 20 Caterpillar. And uh, it was a very popular tractor in its day. In the 20s then they have this larger tractor here. It's what they call a 60. It's a, another four cylinder, it's a 1928. And it's a six and a half inch bore and eight and a half inch stroke. It runs 650 RPM. This was a very popular tractor for construction or road building. And we had one farmer here that farmed with two of these. Now this tractor here is a model 75 Holt tractor, built in about 1917. And it, uh, at that time, the Caterpillar or Holt, whatever it was then, had the front wheel on the front there and a track in the back and uh, as I understand in later years they found out that they didn't need that front wheel when this was pulling real hard I've seen it you know, the front end was right up the wheel was off the ground and it has a way of being started with a bar you insert the bar in the flywheel and pull it over over such as that but one thing you had to make sure that you had your magneto or your spark set right or it would f fire backwards and when it did that it would throw the bar and 
if you happen to be in the way of the bar, well, it was more or less curtains. It used the steering wheel, also steering clutches on that right-hand side. Now we can come over here, and here's a couple of later model Caterpillars. This one here, there wasn't too many of them around this country. It's a Caterpillar 28. It was made in the 30s, 33 to 35. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a good machine, but there wasn't too many of them sold. Now, here's another Caterpillar that was made in the 30s. It's a 25 drawbar horsepower, but they called it the 22. And uh, there was quite a few of these around. The, the farmers were using smaller tractors then, and, and uh, after they got to, in the later years, they'd come up and, and use bigger tractors. Well, this is a 1937 TD-40, and uh, this uh, International had a unique way to start these diesel tractors. You had a conversion on there that you opened a chamber, combustion chamber, with another valve, and you started them on gas, and after they got so many RPMs or warmed up, then it would be switched over to diesel. And it worked, uh, it worked real good. This this is a T-35. It has a six-cylinder gas engine. It's a, a little bit smaller bore than the T-40. And it was a, uh, there wasn't too many of these engines around. I had quite a time finding this, this engine here, a, T, a T-35. This tractor I spent many hours on. My father bought this. It had been in a fire. And he bought it and completely rebuilt it. And it's a TD-35, and it is the same operation as far as starting it as that T-40. It would go, it started on gas, and it would run so many RPMs, and then you'd switch it over to, uh, to uh, diesel. Now, when, when my father bought this tractor, it had been in a fire. Uh, a neighbor of ours uh, was a mechanic on it, and he was rebuilding it or working on it, and he spilled some gas on the light bulb and it set the whole building on fire. And uh, after we rebuilt it, we used it for years and years. It was a very trouble-free engine, tractor, and uh, it was very dependable. We had to upgrade it a little bit. We put a different uh, fuel pump on it, but other than that, it's a very dependable tractor. And it, a person could take most of these tractors, these uh, internationals and put them right out in the field today and work them. This tractor is a gray tractor and they call it a 1836 gray. It's a 1920 four cylinder and it has uh, what's unique about this is it has one drum in the back. The drive wheel is a drum about five six feet wide and that is the traction wheel. The motor is crossways and I don't know if they're very popular because a person uh, I just don't know if they're very popular around our area, but uh, it, the operator sits clear off on the right-hand side, and if you're going to line up a belt pulley, the belt pulley is clear over on the left side, and you just can't see anything to it. Uh, this is a, a Navy tractor, which I haven't rebuilt yet, but if I rebuild it, I would leave this patchwork on. This, this patch here is brass or copper rather, and uh, it had been froze up at one time and it was repaired with, with a repair job like that. And I think that's quite unique, the way they did it. I haven't rebuilt this tractor. It's an Avery 1225. This is a Minneapolis, a cost motor Minneapolis. It's about a 1930-31 model. It's, uh, it was quite popular tractor in this, this area. And with what they call a Model B, it's, uh, they had the Model A to start with, and they had a tendency to, it was shorter, and they had a tendency to rear up a little bit when they pulled on it, so they made the, the tractor maybe 10, 10 inches or so longer and called it the Model B. Now this tractor here is a two-cylinder opposed. It is opposed, there's a cylinder, one piston going each direction. It's a 1917, they call it the Moline Universal. It's a row crop tractor, and it uh, has different implements that you can 
attached to the back of the machine. This one so happens to have a two bottom plow, but it hinges right here. When you steer it, the, the front end of the tractor turns, it's hinged in the middle. And of course, this has a plow hook to it. You can put a disc behind here or any other implement. And if you parked the tractor, you had to line up the spokes just right here with the crank to line up the spokes so you can get the crank in there. If you parked it any other direction there or in the wrong place, then you had to move the tractor by hand or some other way to get the, get the crank in there. These are two John Deere's. This is a 1927 model. This is a 1928 Model D, but uh, they're both on steel. This is a McCormick Deering Model F30. That was the largest of the of the uh, Farmall type. This is a 1932 model. Got it on steel on the rear. Now this is a 1020 International. They had a 1530 and a 1020. In our area, the 1530 was the most popular, but there's quite a few of these. We had a real good dealer. Now this tractor here is an International McCormick Deering, a WK40. You started on gas and you switch it over to diesel, or distillate. Now my father bought this in 1936 and uh, I thought that was the grandest tractor that was ever made. And if I got a chance to drive it, I thought, well, that was, I'd never get enough of it. But after a year or two, I had plenty. It's a high-speed motor. It runs 1,750, I believe. We used this for years. It was a very powerful tractor. This 75 Monarch is quite popular in this country for farming and construction. It's a 1928 model. It has a Leroy motor in it. It's a six and a half by seven inch bore. And uh, these uh, Monarch tractors, uh, instead of having bull gears in them, they had roller chains in the back for the final drives. In here, most tractors have uh, final drives, big gears in, in here to drive the tracks, where this has a big roller chain, one on each side. And we got this from a Caterpillar dealer in Great Falls, and he donated it to this museum. His name was Henry Sheffels, and he passed away, but his sons still live in Great Falls. They don't have the Caterpillar dealership anymore, but they are farmers, very successful farmers north of Great Falls. This is a Monarch tractor, too. It's a 50-crawler tractor, and it was used on a farm just north of our place here. I acquired it, rebuilt it, and put it in the museum. It's a 1920, and it has the same roller chain drive in the back as the 75 Monarch. This is a 35 Monarch. Well, it was Monarch, and uh, Alice Chalmers took Monarch over, and uh, they merged or was taken over, and they were using uh, what parts they had, as I understand, up until they uh, went in with their own Alice Chalmers tractor. And all three of these tractors here, the Monarch, the 75, and the, the 35, are run with, you run them with steering wheel. You have a steering wheel instead of steering clutches. But later on, they went to the levers. Now, this is a, a Russell tractor. It's a small one. <clears throat> it's a 1020 horsepower, but 1917 model. And I got this from a fellow in Oregon by the name of George Best. And uh, the only time it has ever run after I got it is when George comes. He, he likes to play with it, even if he has it, doesn't own it anymore. It's uh, the only model of the 1020 that has the, the, the belt pulley on the front. Later on, the next year, they put the belt pulley back here. And this is 1917, as I understand, is the only year that they put the belt pulley on the front. This, they, uh, they used the, the Holstein Bull as an uh, emblem. And then this one they called the Little Boss. 
Now this is a formal, McCormick Deering formal, an F-14. It's the year 1938, it's a 14 drawbar horsepower. It uh, was made from 1938 to 1939, and it's a, just about the same machine as this F-12 here, except the motor ran 250 RPMs, RPMs faster. And uh, with the steel, this tractor sold for 630 or for $55, something like that, new. And right here is an F-20. That is the size larger than the 14. And uh, up here, uh, this tractor here is a farm all. It's one of the first farm malls built by uh, Mc uh, McCormick the Inter International Harvester. It was built from 1923 to 1932, and it was known as a regular. And it was a very popular tractor when it first came out because it had the uh, colorator and everything attached to it, and also it had an open gear, which uh, later on they enclosed the gears for the steering. And it kept improving every year, but, but this is one of the first farm all type tractors. This is a W30, and that was uh, come after the 1530 Internationals. Uh, there's a pair of 2035 Rumleys. They're both the same. They're what they call a lightweight. They're two cylinder drive, two cylinders to them. And uh, the only difference between these two Rumleys is one has a solid flywheel over there, and this one has a spoke flywheel. And as I understand, or I was told that the solid flywheel, if there was any knock or any vibration, anything in the motor that didn't sound right, it, that solid flywheel was like a sounding board that made it magnified, all the sounds. So they went back to the spoke flywheel, like this one right here. They were quite popular tractor in their day. These are 2035s, and here is a 3060 oil pull Rumley. And when they say oil pull, well, it strictly means that it's, uh, as far as I know, it's uh, oil cooled. It uh, doesn't have water to cool it, it's oil cooled. And I've never run this engine, but uh, it runs pretty good. It's a nine inch bore, 11 inch stroke, and it's a 3060 lightweight. It was made from 1924 to 1928. This is a Twin City uh, tractor. It was made in 1920. It's a 2035. It has a five and a half inch bore and a six and a three quarter inch stroke. Yeah, it's sure it'll run. Here's another Twin City. It's a 1728. And um, it's um, a 1930 model. And we'll go back to this 2035. There's something unique about that or something different. The oil, the valves are oiled by oilers up here, where all the rest of them, or most of them, are made internal uh, oiling system, where this tractor, you take in the, once or twice a day, you had to take all four of them, and there's twin valves on it. Four valves to each cylinder. This is a TD-24 International. It was, was issued to the Marines in World War II, and I acquired it from a farmer that used it after the war for farming. and. Uh, uh, when I found this tractor, it was in a, they traded it in to a machinery company, and I uh, went back to the farmer and I got all the parts that he had stripped down that was military, and I acquired it from him, and they, uh, I put it back and I put the, the numbers of the U.S. Marine Corps, I could see through the paint that he had painted it red, and I could see all the numbers, and I put it all back original. It has a large winch on the front it is driven through the power takeoff it has a wide seat up here they have a place here they say for the 
for the, if they put their luggage, it has two tanks on it, and uh, it runs quite well. This is a Harris Combine. It was given to the museum by our neighbor, Ralph Bumgardner, and I believe it's about a 1940 model, and it is a side hill machine. It has a full leveling device on each side where one side, get on the side hill, one side will elevate up and one side would elevate down, vice versa. And uh, it has never sat outside that I know of, except when they were using it. And when he retired from farming, it was in the building for maybe 10, 15 years, and he said that it should be down here in the museum. And he gave it to me. It is complete. I have the header for it and all parts to put it back into operation. We had this tractor running yesterday. It's a Flower City. It's a 4070 horsepower. They're produced by the Kennard Sons Manufacturing Company in Minneapolis, Minnesota. cylinder tractor and the drive wheels is eight feet in diameter and 24 inches wide it weighs 21,000 pounds it's a unusual tractor and we acquired that from a farmer that had it all taken apart for the bolts that was in it it was further completely disma dismantled and uh, he kept all the pieces and my father and I went to look at it. It was scattered all over the ranch, and the, everything that we asked about, he had it. And so we acquired it and put it back together. had shows here. The last few years we've been having a show. We don't advertise. Anybody that wants to come or is welcome to come, we don't charge and we don't sell anything here. It's just a gathering of people who share a common interest in keeping these old machines up in working condition. Somewhere between a family reunion and a big engine show, the museum attracts people like Clyde Corley, with 90 years of experience and know-how, Clyde is an invaluable asset when it comes to operating and maintaining this equipment. That's the deal. It's a, about a 1911 case, I'd say. And uh, a, I think that's a 618. <laughs> there weren't very many of these in this part of the country. Most of them were, those engines were used, were traction engines, and they were used to plow and and to uh, thrash with. But well, it keeps you busy. Yeah. Yes, you, you, have, you have to look after it or it'll, it'll stay together. Clyde is always willing to share his expertise if you're lucky enough to cross his path at the museum. Clyde also shared some surplus steam energy to cook this afternoon's lunch. Uh, no, they, that, well, yeah, they had the steam up, so they just well used it. Get your lens steamed up, maybe. Watch that hose there, buddy. This is just a, a good get-together for uh, people that are interested in this type of hobby. My father started the thrashing beer here in about 1954, and he proceeded to have this show until he was unable to in about 1970. Then we just had a 
a little steam up every year just to keep in practice. And since I retired about 10 years ago, well, then we've increased it and, and did a little more every year. The two 110 cases out in the field, one case, 110, pulled a 12 bottom plow, John Deere plow. The next one, 110, pulled an eight bottom John Deere plow. The Nichols and Shepherd pulled a six bottom John Deere plow. And the uh, 75 case was pulling another six bottom John Deere plow. That's uh, old steamer plows, they're all uh, obsolete and antiques. Those plows were, were used to break up this country years ago when uh, they uh, homesteaded. They tried to plow it with horses, but uh, like my father said, that the uh, ground is a gumbo type, type clay, real hard to plow. And they said that they couldn't hardly plow it with horses. They're just hard on the horses. So they brought these big old steamers into the country to break this ground for the first time, to plow it. After they plowed it, then the tractors were, steamers were more or less obsolete. They were slower, and it took too many men to operate a steam engine, where it takes a water van and two men operating the, the steamer, and uh, you have to have coal hauled and everything. And so the gears were open gears, too, and in the loose ground, the gears wore out so fast. So then they started coming in with lighter tractors in closed gears. And most of these tractors were either, if they were saved, they were used for uh, thrashing, sawmilling, or something like that, where they didn't use them for too much for traction. And uh, they were just got obsolete. And of course, every, I remember every uh, farm had a lot of them sitting in the back lots. It's a 2070 Nicholas Shepard, about a 1914 model, and I'd say it is one of our smoothest running steam engines. And uh, I got that complete uh, with way back in the mountains in a sawmill, and it was in the, in the building, out of sight and everything, and uh, I was very fortunate to find it. And everybody that runs it, they just think it's uh, just like an Elgin watch. This 110 case that uh, my father started farming with 
was back in the mountains on an upper place, what we call the mountain ranch. And uh, it was uh, back in the hills. Uh, people didn't uh, have too much uh, as far as uh, cutting torches to cut these tractors up. And so it was salvaged, and it is one of my dad's tractors that he started farming with. And it happened to be back up in the mountains. But anything that we had here on the ranch, which was very rare equipment, like big self-propelled combines that pull themselves with caterpillar tracks, several of those were burned up and scrapped, and uh, we had some big old R Republic truck, and uh, anything that we had here that was close to the scrap yard, my dad scrapped it to, for the war effort. on the whistle could mean different things depending on the job being done and was used to communicate between the engineer and the crew. You see here a short toot means we're beginning a new row. Engage the plows.
Nothing like a few good laps around the wheat field to invigorate the soul. Give the old bones one last drop in the hay, so to speak, before heading back to the barn for winter. Hook a plow to these machines, and it seems as if they come alive. Their massive power enabled farmers to break the soil and plant crops where previously impossible. The force that brought industrialization to the American farm was steam. These traction engines, being the forerunner of the gasoline tractor, were one of the first steps in America's agricultural productivity boom of the late 1800s and the early 1900s. started to put things in for the evening, including this freshly painted Wallace tractor. First built around 1928, this tractor has been sitting patiently in back, waiting its turn for a second go-round, thanks to Carl's continuing restoration and preservation efforts. Seeing the Wallace back in action springs hope eternal to those still on the waiting list. So if you've got some spare time and find yourself in this part of Montana, do yourself a favor and stop in and visit the museum. You surely won't regret it. You might even end up adopting a restoration project of your own. If you know anything about railroad engines, we've got one waiting for your attention. There's always plenty to see and usually something to do. We were never quite able to get the Avery 4080 up under its own power this trip, nor were we able to count all of Carl's tractors. And I guess that's a lost cause. The number changes on a regular basis as new projects reach completion. So now it's back inside until next year when I bet the Avery is up and running along with a Montgomery Ward sawmill that has since been restored. We want to thank the Memke family for their dedication and perseverance in keeping this museum alive and open to the public, so we can all continue to experience and learn from the hard work of our ancestors, whose labors bore the fruits of an agricultural industry that dominates the world to this day. especially like to thank Carl for keeping his father's vision, whose dedication, knowledge, and enthusiasm continues to inspire the next generation to keep the spirit of America's agricultural heritage alive. My family has been here since about 1892. My dad was raised here. I was born here. I have a son, and I have a, a grandson here, and I have a great-grandson. I hope it will carry on, yes. For a copy of this show on VHS video, call toll-free. 888-560-9980 or visit us on the internet at www.ironclassics.com.